Does the Bible support the theory that the earth is only 6,000 years old, or is it billions of years old, like the scientists say? Okay, so this is a great question because it comes to the question of creationism versus the, the theory of evolution. And so the question is, what about the dating of the earth, and, and how do Christians engage in this topic? So let me just say this. Christians are not in any way and should never be scared of science. As if to say science is like the kryptonite to Christianity. That they are going to expose the fallacy, the lies of Christianity. They were like, oh, we just got exposed. I am not worried at all by scientific inquiry. Not at all. I do recognize that a lot of scientific inquiry, as is true for everybody individually, comes with many scientists with existing presuppositions. That's existing beliefs before you get to study the beliefs. And I say that to recognize sometimes science has already ruled out things that can or cannot be true. So as a Christian, I am starting with the beginning of all of history as presented to me in the Bible because of what my belief is about the Bible, that the belief about the Bible is this is inspired, meaning it comes from God. It is inerrant, which means it is without any error. It is also authoritative, sufficient, and clear. So having established that, then the question is, as a Christian, when I come to something like Genesis, what do I do? Because I think sometimes Christians are a little bit nervous about Genesis because they kind of want academic or rational credibility in the eyes of their non-Christian colleagues at work or professionals or professors at universities, and they're kind of like quiet with Genesis and hope we can maybe survive, maybe Leviticus, and maybe get into like Deuteronomy, like, okay, I think we can talk now. Don't feel like that. Don't be panicked. Here's what we want to recognize. What we see in Genesis is God creating the world. So we're dealing with an issue of origin. Now this is fundamental because everybody on the planet has to answer four questions. Number one, origin. How do we get here? Number two, meaning. What is the meaning of life? Number three, morality. How are we supposed to live while we're here? And number four, destiny. What happens when we die? What's next? Everybody has to have an answer to the question of origin. Some people want to close their eyes, plug their ears, but that doesn't answer the question. The Christian believes that the origin of all of existence starts with God's creation. Now the question is, how did matter, how did molecules, how did atoms, how did they come into pass? What, what pre-existed before them? Nothing. God spoke it and he made it so. So the question is being asked here in that context is, what about the age of the earth? Well, to show my hand to you, where does Eric believe, where does Pastor Eric believe? I believe in what's referred to as a young earth. A young earth that is by estimation anywhere from six to 10,000 years old. However, there are other faithful gospel believing Christians who believe in an old earth. But here is where both groups of Christians believe. They do not believe in theistic evolution, which is that God used evolution to create. That's not what any Christian believes. Furthermore, all Christians believe in a literal Adam, a physical, in the person, in the flesh Adam. That when there was a literal Adam, Adam literally was having a personal relationship with God, literally ate from the tree. And the reason why is because if you don't have a literal physical Adam, it undermines the gospel as we see in Romans chapter 5. Because as in, all, as in Adam all died, so in Christ all lived. So if we have no Adam, then it undermines the whole gospel. The question comes the cadence of the days of creation. In the beginning, God created and it was so. In the beginning, God created and it was so. And so the question is, is that a literal 24-hour day? Or is that a period of time? And some Christians can disagree on that. Some Christians will come to that text in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and say, that is a poetic, Hebrew poetic representation about time that's not intended to be captured as a literal grammatical hermeneutic. The problem there, I would say to my Christian friends who believe in an old earth, the problem there is you have to at some point go, we're slowing the clock down here to be a literal physical atom in a day here. When would that happen? The other challenge here that we have to recognize is not age being created with, the earth being created already with years. For example, Adam was created at an age already. Adam was not created as an infant. He was created already with age. 
Hence his ability to marry, his ability to be with Eve and for them to procreate. In other words, God's ability to create life that already has years associated with it is no more common to but difficult to believe with Adam than it is in anything of earth. An existing tree, an existing mountain, an existing any of that. More could be said, but there's volumes of written on this. So I'm doing my best job to be quick here. All right. Boom. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10 says, Women should dress, uh, dress with modest apparel, with property and moderation, with you know, proper moderation. Please explain modesty. And I think there was a question earlier, or later rather. Okay, yeah, later on down there it says about dress. Lots of Bible verses going on here. Encouraging women, please correct me if I'm wrong, to wear the qualities of Christ. Okay, so let, let's, let's talk about this issue because this is a great question. I'm happy to talk about this. So what we have to recognize is that the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, let a woman learn quietly with all submissive. In verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she should remain quiet. And it says here, um, no, earlier. Sorry, let me go earlier. Uh, verse 9, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Later on, Peter, different author, says regarding women, he says, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is God's sight very precious. Now, the question is the, the discussion about modesty, which is a great topic in any culture, especially ours in Miami. Hello? I mean, really? Am I the only one? That's why I say this. Because in every culture, different time, there are values that the culture represents practically. So there are different parts of the world where different parts of a woman's body or man's body are not seen as being sexualized, or not seen as being presented as being immodest or modest, as appropriate or inappropriate. It just, it is what it is. It's sort of like just human anatomy. Like no one has ever struggled with like looking at my elbows. Never. Ever. Or your elbows for that matter. At least here in Miami. The point is, Different parts of the world at different times and culture assign value, assign beauty, assign identity, assign modesty and immodesty to what presents, what is revealed over versus what is concealed. The challenge for us in Miami is that we are a city who has a reoccurring dominant idol of beauty, of youthfulness, of pulsating sexuality. And a lot of the women today and a lot of the men today find their identity in their intrinsic youthfulness, their unbelievable excessive fitness, their unbelievable expression of vain beauty that is always trying to present themselves as being desirable, as being affirmed and secure. And the challenge is Christian women and I mean to speak kindly to my Christian sisters here, are sometimes in the middle of making that growth in Christ to know how should I find my identity? Where should I associate such values and such qualities? And I want to just caution you as ladies to say, if you are finding your identity and your security in your outfits, God is like, you are missing it entirely. Because what we see in 1 Timothy is that what we are known for is not how we associate what we adorn ourselves with our dress, but we are known for our godliness. We are known for our good works. Now, that is not meaning that, oh, so I can wear whatever I want as long as I'm like, you know, super godly. Well, no, that kind of like defeats the point of what the Scripture's teaching. The Scripture's teaching culturally this issue of braided hair, this issue of dresses. Well, this expression is talking about cultural expressions of immodest. So at that time, apparently, it would be basically like a, a low-key, humble brag to like, oh, check out her hair. Mm, girlfriend has got it going on. And when she got dressed and she went out, she knew exactly what she was doing to get people to look at her. And Paul is like, uh, can I have a minute with all the women, please? And Peter's like, uh, Paul, when you get done, let me know, because I'd like to have a word too as well. 
But this is a problem not only for women but also for men and how we present ourselves and where we find our security and identity because of the temptation for pulsating sexuality, the temptation for personal insecurity. Now, the temptation and reaction is to legalize modesty. Skirt length, shirt length. But let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. What if what you knew, what you were doing, and I think a lot of you maybe even know this if you're honest, would be a cause of others stumbling? Would that make you want to rethink through what you're wearing and what you're doing? Because some of you right now are thinking, listen, I'm not responsible for somebody else's struggles. Don't put that on me. Ooh, 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 careful, careful, careful. Because Paul repeatedly talks about, even in his own practice, his willingness to give up liberty for the sake of charity out of love for his brother that he might not cause them to stumble. If meat causes you to stumble, he says, I'll, I'll never meet again. So there's liberty but the question is, in Galatians 5, do we lose our liberty to serve ourselves or to serve others? And the challenge for us in the context of our culture in the 21st century, because of numbers of us having struggles with same-sex attraction, women desiring women, men desiring men, this isn't some kind of common, traditional, co-ed type of concern. It's bigger than that. It's more than that. And we have to treat it with discretion and care and love. I do think it's appropriate to notice in Titus chapter 2, older women are known for speaking into younger women's lives, as older men are known for speaking into older, younger men's lives. And the question is, ladies, who speaks into your life? If someone was to speak to you, would you receive it as helpful feedback, or would you be reviled and dismiss it as legalistic oppression? This is not what I thought Grace Church was about. When someone's trying to show the grace to consider something they maybe have never considered. Because too often, even mothers taking their daughters shopping are so glad for the moment that their daughters want to go shopping with them that they're, not con that they're concerned about what they're wearing, but they're more concerned about the relationship of the mother with the daughter that they say nothing. And as a result of that, they just tell themselves, well, they mean well. As if to say ignorance should somehow dismiss any responsibility for presentation, but then they grow on to be adult women in society, and they find themselves by comparison of others being seemingly modest. Well, you think I'm bad, you should see what she's wearing. But wait, when does that have been the reference? So the idea here is, is that we adorn ourselves with godliness, and godliness brings those identities and passions and securities in place of how we present ourselves. Similar to the conversation about creation, more could be said, but I hope I've at least framed this to begin the conversation, but let me just say we should be careful, let me just say this, we should be careful, ladies and gentlemen, removing all the mystery of your beauty, presenting it to us in public that there's virtually no mystery in your marriage bed to your spouse. We don't have to wonder what you're going to look like in your marriage bed because you've already presented it to us already. Song of Solomon is a delight between the marital love between a man and a woman in the context of the marriage bed, not only because they get to enjoy physical intimacy, and I'm speaking coded because of younger children in the room, but also the ability to discover what they had previously been concealed and never known. But today, to conceal is to be seen as old-fashioned. Next, let's get to why do different Christian denominations have such different beliefs on baptism and when should it be done? It's a great question and I'm happy to answer this because some of you maybe come from different traditional backgrounds where you have participated in as an infant, kind of unwillingly participated and you didn't know. Uh, it was kind of decided for you and you're like, hey, did that count or would I have to do a do-over? What is that? Um, a theological tradition that said that the faith of the parents that you were born into the family of, their identification with your family, you being identified with them, that you are by uh, traditional theological interpretation should be baptized accordingly as an infant. So that would be true with Presbyterianism, Episcopalianism, Lutheranism, Methodism. If you come from any of those backgrounds, that would probably be a practice of yours. Whereas Baptistic churches that are like Grace Church and others 
would say, in the reading of the New Testament, you do not see examples of anybody who has been baptized who has not first put their faith in Christ. And even the two examples in the book of Acts of household believers is not some type of case like, hey, all the infants got baptized too. It's like a whole package deal. Like, hey, mom and dad believe you're getting baptized too. We're all in this thing now as a covenant. We are not saying what some people have said, which is that New Testament baptism replaces Old Testament circumcision. We do not believe that's what the New Testament teaches. But that the New Testament is an expression of a response of all those who believe would indeed respond in obedience in faith. So that is a brief explanation of that. Next question, how do I balance Grace Church functions, events, and studies, and parachurch opportunities? Another great question. First of all, let's uh, make sure we understand the word parachurch. Parachurch is similar to the word paraclete, which is what the Holy Spirit's title is, one of his titles in the New Testament. Paraclete means to come alongside. This is why the Holy Spirit is known as a comforter. He comes alongside the Christian. He reveals the word of God to the Christian. He is given as a pledge of his inheritance in Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is. He comes alongside. Well, a parachurch is that same idea. It is a ministry that comes alongside the church to supplement the church's ministry in ways that maybe it cannot do on its own or entirely. So a good example of this that we had this past weekend is the ministry of Scarlet Hope. That is a parachurch ministry that has an expressive value, like life centers who are giving women the hope for another decision than abortion to be able to consider adoption or care for the delivery and the raising of their own children. These are meaningful parachurch ministries. But the question is, what should I be doing with my time and doing with my money as it relates to my church versus parachurch? And I would say this, it should supplement where your priority is, which is in the local institution of the church, which is what Jesus says he's made the promise to build. So not saying that as a pastor being self-serving, I say this in the confidence of what he says in Matthew 16, upon his profession, being Peter's profession of faith in Matthew 16, upon this profession, I will build my church. His promise is to build the church, of which is universal, but is locally seen in local churches. So we never want to spend time outside of the church to neglect of the ministry in our own local church, where we are testifying collectively of the power of the gospel as Christ brings us together. Because parachurches are honestly specialized and meaningful, but nuanced. Collective local churches is the gathering of Christians together in a number of ways and relationships that shows the priority of where we give and spend our time accordingly. And so I would say you invest there, and as you have extra margin and capacity, you can then invest accordingly with parachurch based on the freedom you have in Christ. Should an active pursuit of a non believing friend to be saved ever cease? It just depends what you mean by pursuit. Sometimes pursuit is just ongoing prayer. I would say in that situation, never stop praying in so much as they come to mind or they're present in front of you relationally. That's certainly going to be true if you're related to the person. Probably until the day you die, you're going to pursue them when given the opportunity. You're going to pursue them as you think about praying for them. But at the same time, I do not want you to feel the burden that you are responsible for anybody's conversion. Paul makes it very clear in the book of Corinthians, chapter 1, 2, and 3, as he's talking about the ministry of the apostles, as a sort of ranking who's their favorite. I'm of Cephas, which is another name for Peter. I'm of Paulos. I'm of Paul. So I'm like, oh yeah, I got checkmate. I'm of Jesus. And Paul's like, wait, knock it off, would you? Knock it off. He says, everything we do is built upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Nothing we do actually matters. It's what Christ says. I mean, he makes a statement. He says, one man plants, another man waters, that God causes the growth. So is it possible that God has you for a season of time in a non-Christian's life, maybe as a coworker, maybe somebody you work out with, maybe somebody you live next door to, and that's where God has you for that season to be a missionary in relationship to that person. And you'll do that for a number of years, and then it'll be done. And you, in your lifetime, will never see the fruit of that. But then maybe God brings somebody else along in their life to use them as a watering ministry, and then God sometime, in some way, in the mystery of his will, converts that person, they're saved. And you had the privilege of being able to tell others about Jesus. Friends, that is an opportunity. So it's not the person you're constantly pursuing, it's the practice. And sometimes, because of relationships being lifelong, you'll always have that practice. 
few more. Is joy a mindset? It is. It's a mindset, but let me be clear, a mindset that's not like a self-will, like, you know, look, yourself, look at yourself in the mirror and just try to give yourself a pep talk on a daily basis. It's a mindset because of where your mind is set. On Jesus Christ. On Jesus Christ. The hope of glory. And so what you see for Paul, his mind is set on Christ, not his emotion, which honestly is rising and falling. His perspective is his rejoicing is in Christ, which he says in Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That common phrase, in the Lord. That is where we should be. One more. Mm, which one do we do here? Um, okay, I want to answer this question because I think it's important for everybody, though only one person's asking it. When should I seek counsel on a decision? Should I seek counsel on every decision? This is a great question. Why? Because we, you and I are making decisions all the time. Jobs we should take, apartments we should rent, relationships we should pursue, people we should date, people we should marry, opportunities we should say no to, things that we should buy. Should every decision be a decision we seek counsel on? No. Why? Because over time, we will increasingly have the mind of God based on the word of God, based on an affection for God, and that that can be trusted in the reality that some things are obvious. Should I seek counsel on whether or not I should do things inherently immoral? No, you don't have to seek counsel on that. Like, you know the answer. I'm wondering, should I ask my godly friends that they, if I should open a casino? No, no, you should not. You don't have to ask your friends because you already know the answer. No, come on, really? You're like, oh, really? I didn't know that actually. Was, I, I should, okay, I shouldn't have asked maybe. I don't know. Should I have asked if I actually didn't know that was the answer? The idea here is that you want to, first of all, realize you have been given a company of Christians, as the scripture says in Proverbs, that wisdom is in found in a company of counselors, that people who help you discern by asking yourself questions that you might not know to ask yourself. What's motivating you? What do you want? If you got this, how would it deliver for you? If you didn't get it, how would you respond? Why? Because it'll often expose idols. What I want is what I want, and I'll do anything to get it, even if I have to sin against the Lord. If that's true, that's concerning. So here's the question. Do some of you not seek counsel for your decisions because you're worried about the counsel you're going to get? Well, in that, you begin to find out that you probably in your conscience already know the answer. Should I be dating this girl? Should I be dating this guy? Should I get married to them? So we have the mind of God. We can see, for example, in many different times in 1 Thessalonians 4, it talks about the will of God for our sanctification, that we should walk in the spirit, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That does not mean anything you want, you get. He's saying your desires will start to change as you're delighting in God. And I just want to encourage you to realize that as you think about the word of God.